We'll start. Are you ready over there with the camera? Thank you. You're the most important guy here today. Hello, let's get started and then see if we can have other people following us after a while. My name is Alexander Bard. I live in Stockholm, Sweden. I have two jobs. Uh, I work as a record producer with Universal Music. So I make music and make records and work with a lot of different artists. Um, and my latest project that I work with there is called Gravitonas. And if you like, you can Google it. So I'm not just going to leave it there. Because that's not why I'm here today. The fact that I work as a record producer and uh, that I work with streaming and all kinds of new services where people can share music and films and entertainment of all kinds, and I also produce content for that, is the fact that I want to practice what I preach. So I love to be involved with something creative myself. So that's the only point I want to make concerning my career as a musician and a record producer. The reason why I'm here today is my other job. Uh, I work at the Stockholm School of Economics, and I've been hired there since, well, I was hired there in 1995. And uh, since then, since the mid-1990s, I've been working as one of the world's first internet philosophers. And I was hired exactly for that reason. There was this huge new phenomenon that appeared suddenly in the 1990s. It was called the internet. And people tried to understand this new phenomenon using very old models, which they tried to fit in. That's, that's for example, why they developed the dot-com companies in the 1990s. They used an old model, applied it on a brand new phenomenon, and completely failed. And I was one of the people who told them they would fail. But they didn't really listen to me, because what I do is something that is so profoundly ahead of its time all the time, that I have to expect that if I get 15 people in an audience to listen to me, I should be very happy with that. But the, word, the history of philosophy has always been like that. I'll give you a perfect example. One of my absolute favorite philosophers is Friedrich Nietzsche, who incidentally was a German, although he hated Germany. And Friedrich Nietzsche worked for over 40 years. He wrote amazing books. Some of them sold only 50 copies at the time when they were released because nobody understood what he was about. And only about 30 years after he happily died in syphilis, which he did in 1899, only about 30 years later, in the 1920s, Nietzsche was finally recognized as a philosopher and not just a mad guy. And eventually, by the end of the 20th century, he was widely considered the biggest philosopher of all time. So you can also understand why I love being a record producer, because being a record producer gives me instant gratification. Within three months, I probably have a hit record in the charts, and I'm famous or whatever, and I make money. But when I work with philosophy, it's such damn hard work, and I have to be humble, because I realize very few people understand what I'm doing, usually only other philosophers. But what I love about doing philosophy on the internet is the fact that even within my own lifetime, ideas that I can develop can be turned into companies, they can be turned into ideal organizations, they can be turned into different forms of activism. And I'll give you a couple of examples in that case. My work has inspired, for example, a lot of people at Google and Facebook to do what they do. But it has also fundamentally inspired, for example, the pirate movement. Rick Falkwing, who founded the pirate movement, is a close friend of mine. So the ideas come from the same roots. What I realized when the Stockholm School of Economics gave me resources to explore the internet was that nobody understood this phenomenon. The internet is much more profound than anybody of us has understood so far. And here comes something about us human beings. We tend to be extremely narcissistic. It's called anthropocentric in a philosophical term. Anthropocentric means that we think that we have ideas, we control the world with our ideas, and because of our ideas, we can change the world. But history teaches us again and again that history does exactly what history wants, and we can only follow. And the internet is exactly that type of, type of a phenomenon. The internet is a hydra. It is a monster. And we've let this monster out of the bottle, and it's now controlling us. There is no way we can control the internet. 
So when you think about the internet, you think about wonderful things like Google and Facebook and dating services and LinkedIn and fun games. And almost all of this is almost for free. And that's a wonderful thing. But you also have to realize that the internet, for example, fostered Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda would not have existed without the internet. It's a typical internet phenomenon. And we're going to see a lot of really horrible things coming out of the internet over the next 100 years. For example, my job is to be neutral about the internet. My job is not, compared to all the other sales pitch guys you find here at Campus Party, I'm the only one here who's going to tell you nasty things about the internet. Because my job is to be neutral. And that's exactly why I spend some of my money to go and study Japanese subway suicide sects. Because in Japan, you find these 20 guys meet online, they create a community together, they talk to each other every day for two or three years, then suddenly one day on a Tuesday morning, they go down to the subway of Tokyo and all kill themselves. And the rest of the world have no idea why. That's a typical internet phenomenon. The internet will make a lot of us people go absolutely apeshit crazy and kill ourselves. In 2009, I participated in a big study in Sweden they just discovered that the number of teenage girls who were seeking urgent treatment in psychiatry had quadrupled in the last 10 years. Suddenly there were four times more girls in 2009 in Sweden who were seeking urgent psychiatric help compared to 1999. And I could prove that the reason they did that was because of internet mobbing. The internet is a nasty thing and it's a wonderful thing at the same time. And the more I've studied, the more I've worked with this over the last 15 years, the more convinced I become that it's one of the biggest revolutions in human history, even possibly the biggest one of all. So, what I did was that I started working on writing books. I know books sounds terribly old-fashioned. I hate using the word books. I don't even call myself a writer. I'm a text producer because I love e-books. I, I hate all physical things. I hate CDs. I love Spotify and streaming. I hate books, but I love e-books. And I love text, because in a text you can uh, explore an issue. So what I can do today with you guys here is we start a dialogue together. You can find me on Facebook or Twitter. My name is here. You're absolutely welcome to contact me directly. And that's why I love being here, not being at a business conference, but rather being at a student conference, which is what this is. You can contact me, and if you want to develop any of these for ideas further, you can join me. And I can tip you off in different directions online where you can explore your ideas even further. It doesn't matter if you want to develop a new fun game, or if you want to go into, say, a religious movement, or whatever you want to do online. I think I can direct you exactly where you want to go. And we can start a communication here today in Berlin, and make new friendships, and then we can develop that further. That's just applying the internet phenomenon to physical reality in real life. That's what we should do all the time now. So, uh, I started writing books together and I got a guy called Jan Söderqvist, who's a media theorist, to do this for me. And that's exactly why I was asked to come here today, to actually explicitly talk about our books. And they were just all three of them, the three books so far. And they were just all three of them just published in America. This is the physical version of it, if you really, really want a physical book. It's called the Futurica Trilogy when you buy all three in one package. So all you need to do is to Google Futurica. Nice thing, because it's got a new original word. Futurica is actually a new literary genre, meaning the mixture of philosophy and future studies. Which is, of course, exactly what I do. If you mix future studies and the world of philosophy, that's what I do. And you can get all three. You can also get them separately. The first book is called The Netocrats. What is a netocrat? A netocrat is a word that was developed by the editorial team at Wired magazine in America in 1992. And the word netocrat is a combination of internet and aristocracy. It was a definition of the new superclass that are going to rule the internet. There were no netocrats around when we wrote the book. It was published 12 years ago and it became a groundbreaking work in internet philosophy. There were no netocrats around at the time, but by 2005, I could start to name a few of them. Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who founded Google, are definitely netocrats. 
They're not old industrialists. They create an enormous amount of power concentrated in their hands just by sorting information and nothing else, which is the definition of an etocrat. I would say Julian Assange is an etocrat. He's a mad guy. I have no idea what his sex life really is like. But he's a friend of mine, and he's an extremely charismatic character, and WikiLeaks being a typical netocratic phenomenon, Julian Assange is one of these guys. And I, I was in Stockholm yesterday at a conference with, with Jen Robinson, his, his lawyer. We were on the same panel. And Jen is a good friend of mine. And we were discussing this, and she said, what do you think of Julian? I said, Julian is the archetypical netocrat. And the reason why Julian is in trouble is because he's fighting an old power structure, because the old power structure consists of nation-state governments and corporations, totally tied together. And the netocrats are people who now fight a war using information, killing the old institutions without weapons. The only weapon they have is information. That is the definition I made of netocracy 14 years ago. Julian Assange personifies that. Another typical netocrat is Rilke Falkvinge, a Swedish guy who started the pirate movement. The Pirat Partei is now the fastest growing political party in Germany since the Greens, 30 years ago. And the pirate movement is also a first real sign of a netocratic movement. There were no netocratic movements around 14 years ago when we defined a netocracy. But we could lay out the way the internet worked, the way computers were connected with each other around the world, thereby connecting every person on the planet with each other into one huge organism, which is what the internet is. It's one sentient being, it's one huge organism that completely occupies us, takes over us like an alien. That's what the internet is. And you could already then 14 years ago say in the future they're going to be netocrats, they're going to start netocratic movements, and of course they're going to fight the old power structure. They are going to be the enemies of governments and the enemies of corporations. Can you imagine me sitting inside the music industry working for the world's biggest record company, Universal Music, trying to make them realize there is no way you can win a war against the pirates, idiots. They will win. History teaches us the new class will always win. It will be a nasty struggle between you and the new guys, but they will win. There's no way you can beat them because the internet will beat all the other previous technologies. It eats everything that comes in its way. When I started with this 15 years ago, I would do IT conferences only. These days, I go to every type of conference there is. The conference in Stockholm I did with Jen Robinson is a conference on sustainability. Where are we going with environmentalism and sustainability now? We use the internet. The only way to save the planet is to save the internet. The proper slogan, if you're interested in saving the planet from climate change and environmental disaster, is the slogan, save the internet so that you can save the planet. And saving the internet means keeping the internet free from governments and corporations, protecting free speech, working underground as hackers, as a political movement to free the internet and keep governments and big corporations away from controlling it. Because if we can keep the internet free as it originally was, away from governments and corporations, we can use it as an enormously powerful tool and create a whole new society that way. That is how profound the internet is. So, we wrote a second book. It's called The Global Empire. I know that sounds absolutely mad, and the book is mad, because it's a book about how the worldview is changing rapidly because of the internet. We need a whole new worldview. The old idea of the world is dead. We live in a new, different type of world. We live in a world that's not only planet Earth and its physical being, but it's also covered in a second layer, which is the Internet, which is the news fair, which is also covering the planet. And these two things, the net and the planet, are now together meeting, creating what we call the global empire, which is the new world. And we just released the third book called The Body Machines. The Body Machines is a book on how idea of who we are has changed completely. What does it mean to be a human being? Being a human being is very, very different today from what it was in the 18th century when the Enlightenment philosophers dictated humanism and individualism. 
from which we built all the political ideologies we've known so far. But the matter of fact is that if you're 20 years old today, your worldview and your idea of who you are is so radically different from your parents who are 50 years old that you and your parents can't communicate with each other anymore. You might think you are at the breakfast table or something, but you're not. Your parents don't understand you. Because if you're 20 years old, your world is so totally different from their world. But the only words and the only concepts that you have accessible to you, the only tools you have to understand your world are the tools that your parents gave to you, the words they gave to you, the concepts they gave to you. And that's exactly why we need philosophy. Because the, what philosophy is, is that philosophy is the academic discipline where you invent new concepts to understand the world better. Philosophy is the production of tools that enables you to understand the world better so that you can go, yeah, that's how things work. Yeah, that's what the world is like. Now I can forget what my dad or my mom told me because this is how the world really works and their story is no longer valid. So, that's enough of a sales pitch. You've got the three book titles there. You can Google Futurica, and if you're interested in my music, you can Google Gravitonas. And most of all, you find me on Twitter, on Facebook, and everywhere else online. And you are perfectly welcome to contact me if you like. And that goes to the web viewers as well. Okay? Enough of that. Oh, this is, by the way, they gave me a campus party t-shirt to wipe this. Isn't that wonderful? It's another good use for a t-shirt. Makes you think differently. Who'd thought of a t-shirt if you used for that? So, what did John Söderqvist and I find out when we started studying the internet phenomenon? Well, to begin with, think about who you are to yourself. Who am I? When you think of who you are, you're probably thinking of a body sitting in an old airport hangar in Berlin at the moment, listening to a mad guy from Sweden with a red beard. But it's also the guy who was born. And what you're thinking about then is that you're thinking of yourself as a timeline. I hate the word timeline because I hate Facebook's timeline. I think it's a disaster. It's the biggest mistake Facebook ever did. I hate timeline. But anyway, it is a timeline here. You are a timeline. You are an idea of who you were when you were born up until now. In other words, you are your life history. Your idea of who you are is always an idea of your own history. And when we look at society, we look at the world, we look at 7 billion people on the planet, it's not really any different. When we think of the concept of society, we think of humanity, we think of the history of humanity. So we have to start here. If we're going to reinterpret everything, if we're going to find a new model that we can apply on the world today in 2012 and forward to understand the world better so that we can be more creative, so that we can hit things right instead of making a lot of mistakes unnecessarily, we have to rewrite history. The first thing we then have to do is to look at cliches. I know cliches are terribly boring. We're all bored with them. We all, we all want to hear a cliche. But cliches are wonderful for philosophers because the reason why cliches are popular is because they're very often true. They often describe the world as it is. And here are three really horrible cliches. One of them is the word information. One of them is the word communication. And one of them is the word network. And when you think about it, over the last 20 years, when people have talked about what is specific for our age, they always come back to, it's an information society, it's a communication society, and it's a network society. But like I said, there's a lot of truth to that. Actually, all those three words are right. We live in an information, communication, network society because we are obsessed with networking, with information and communication, precisely because everything is about those three things today. If you're going to start a company, if you're going to make money, if you're going to have a decent life, you're going to get yourself a husband or a wife or a lover or whatever, if you're going to be a happy person, if you're going to do something meaningful with your life before you die, you're going to be obsessed with these three things. Because everything is about these things today. Factories are now located in the south of China and Bangladesh. That means they're no longer important, otherwise they'd still be in Germany. But this is fucking important. That's why there are thousands of students here today talking about these three things. 
But the problem is, until we started looking at these three terms, it was always discussed as if this was something new. What Söderqvist and I did was to make the radical move of saying that all societies always have been information societies. We've only had information societies. Why do we make that move? Because it makes it look at history in a brand new way. I'll give you an example of how history production works, how histories are being produced. You've heard the terms Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age, right? When you went to school, you were taught there was once a Stone Age, it was followed by a Bronze Age, and then came an Iron Age, right? All agree. Do you seriously think people who lived during the Stone Age were aware of the fact that they were Stone Age people? No, you're laughing. Maybe the Stone Age never existed. Maybe the Stone Age was just invented. Let's Google history and try to find out when was the Stone Age invented. Can I have a guess here? When do you think the Stone Age was invented? When do you think somebody came up with the concept of the Stone Age? So, you're right. In the 1850s. Actually, in the 1850s, all these three terms were invented. Now, I think that that probably says a lot more about Europe in the 1850s than it says about the Stone Age. There must have been a purpose why people in the 1850s were paid to invent the Stone Age. And there were. Look at these three terms. What are they? You're doing philosophy now, by the way. I want to flatter you because this is what philosophy is. It's digging deeper into thought. Stone, bronze, and iron are all physical materials that become powerful and meaningful to us human beings because we tame them. We do something with them. We're supposedly make tools with them. Now, if you live, for example, in Germany in the 1850s, this was the golden era of industrialism. Suddenly, there were factories being built all over Germany. And the factories were extremely powerful symbols of power because whoever owned the factory controlled Germany. Whoever owned the factory would probably be allowed to fuck the most and have the most lovers. You'd be at top of the heap. And because as, as a factory owner, you were also the wealthiest person in Germany in 1850, you would obviously be the guy who paid historians to write history. So you would pay an historian to write a history. And, and if a historian gets money from a factory owner to write a history about humanity, he's very, very likely to write a history that says, first there was stone, then we had bronze, then we got even better and had iron, and one day we built a factory. And the whole meaning of human history is to one day build a factory. Everything else humanity did before that was leading up to the day when the factory was built and history was completed. That's actually a brilliant way of doing history in a very powerful way because what that kind of history writing did was that it sanctified a certain worldview and a certain idea of what it means to be a human being so we all became obedient factory workers who went to factories 16 hours a day and worked really hard for very little pay believing this is what made life meaningful. And that's the really nasty purpose of writing a history, it's to control people. It's to give them a meaning and say that you are here in history and history is wonderful because it's peaking right now and you're part of that peak. But having seen this, having seen the trick, why on earth are we still teaching kids today in school in 2012 that there was a stone age? To me that is absolute madness. What we should do is that we, at Campus Party in Berlin, we are the rulers now of the world. It's our world we're talking about. It's our life. It's, it's, it's our future we're talking about. And what's interesting now is instead, how can we pay today's historians, like me and Sardekvist, to write a new history that is more relevant to us? And that's exactly what our first book, The Netocrats, is. 90% of the book is a history book. Because the first thing we had to do, Jan and I, to understand the internet and to understand how it fucks us up and how it totally controls us and what we can do about it is to rewrite history to understand history better because we are in 2012. Our idea of what it means to be a human being today 
and living in the world today is completely dependent on how we understand history. So that's exactly why we took the trick of saying all societies are information societies. They're not societies that tame physical materials. They're information societies. And what is an information technology? Well, the ultimate form of an information technology is, of course, language itself. What makes human beings distinct from other animals? We do all the other nasty things that other animals do. We're just like them, with one exception. We talk. And because we talk, we think we can think. Thinking is essentially talking to yourself. But we talk. That's something different from other animals. That is an excellent starting point for writing a history. Because what John and I discovered was that if we rewrite history, we will discover that as human beings, we have four different ways of communicating with each other. And the really wonderful thing is that we have introduced these four different ways of communicating with each other at four different points of time in history. And ironically, we can empirically verify their importance because every time we as human beings have invented a new way of communicating with each other, the amount of information available to us that we can use has exploded at least a million times over. And if you look at human history and how it has developed into a civilization that it is today, it's only because of one single factor. Because we've, over time, had more information accessible to us that we can use, we can create more and more complex societies. And of course, the society we live in today in 2012 is the most complex society that ever existed. Because we can handle more and more complexity, and if we can handle more complexity, we can come closer and closer to fulfill our dreams and our needs and our desires. That's exactly the difference between living, say, 2,000 years ago and living today, is the fact that 2,000 years ago you would have to spend a lot of time every day on doing really horrible, boring things. But today you can spend a lot of time doing things you really like to do. Because so many of the other things are outsourced, mechanized, automaticized, that you don't have to deal with them anymore. Just think of a washing machine. You don't have to wash your laundry anymore for four hours a day. You wash your laundry for one minute a day in a washing machine. That's technology, and technology is always information. It's completely dependent on information. It's by having access to more information that we can develop more and more advanced technologies. And the only thing that changes over history is technology. We don't change. Our genetic makeup is almost identical to what it was 100,000 years ago. But what really, really changes over time is technology. And technology is what enables us to live the kind of modern lives we live today compared to the lives we lived 2,000 years ago. So, that's the obvious first paradigm of human history. We start to speak. And by speaking, we're no longer one of the lowest animals on the savanna. We become the kings of the savanna. We can beat the lions and the hyenas and the elephants and control them all because when they attack us, we can shout to each other. When we shout to each other, we can beat the shit out of them. That's a spoken language paradigm. I'm going to leave it there. You can read the rest of the books if you like. Then something happened about 5,000 years ago, ironically, in Iraq of all countries. But 5,000 years ago in Iraq, we develop a second form of communication, which we call written language. We start to write down what we say. We give it symbols. And by writing down information, we can start to store information. Before we could write down information, they, where, was the, where was the maximum amount of information you could find in a nomadic society where people were just talking to each other? The maximum amount of information you could find was in the head of an old lady before she died. That's exactly why they revered old people back then, because the, the tribe was completely dependent on old ladies to survive. Which mushroom you can eat, which mushroom will kill you, how do you fight a war against another tribe, or how do you lose that war? All that information was in the head of the old lady, so when she died, it was disaster. The funerals were huge. If a little baby died, you didn't care. Just threw it away. But if an old lady died, it was a disaster. And that's proven. Archaeologists have proven that's exactly how nomadic tribes work. It's a disaster for them when old people die. When young people die, they don't care. When students die, they don't care. Which is the total opposite of Germany and Spain in 2012. That's ironic. But anyway, that's, with written language, we can store information. Basically, 
What happens with written language is that we can go to the old lady before she dies and make a deep interview with her and ask her, which mushrooms can we eat? Which mushrooms shouldn't we eat? Which mushrooms are fun to eat? You know, all those things. We can ask her anything we like. And we can dig the information out of her brain and store it outside of her brain so that we don't have to repeat her mistakes. We can start to build a civilization on that because we can learn from others we don't have to repeat the mistakes, and we can make something more advanced on top of that. And that is the beauty of written language. It's, the, it, it's an excellent form of storing information outside of the human brain. Now, that kind of, we built a whole society based on that, with permanent settlements and all those things. There's not a single permanent settlement on the planet without written language first. For the simple reason that if you build a village and you're going to live there for 12 months a year, you need an information complexity to make that work, that requires written language. You see here how information is always the starting point of everything. Everything else that happens is dependent on information availability. So after written language, the next big revolution is quite obvious. It started in the 15th century here in Germany, and it's printed language. Printed language, mass distributed language, is the third form of communication. It has an enormous effect on human society. What we know as modern society today, our parents' society, is based on printed language, on mass distributed language. Okay, this is a book. Very old-fashioned thing. This is the old paradigm. The e-book is the new paradigm. This is the old paradigm. Okay, this is a book. Do you know how much it cost to produce a book like this in Europe in 1450, before the printing press? Do you, know, do you know what the cost was in today's euro value of producing a book like this in 1450, before the printing press? Any guess? Okay, I'll tell you. 150,000 euros. It cost 150,000 euros to produce one single fucking book in 1450 in Europe. Consequently, there were very few books, and they were very, very valuable and they were only owned by the wealthiest people, and they were considered sacred. No wonder people back then believed the Bible and the Quran were magnificent books. Some people are still stuck in that paradigm. Some people are still stuck 800 years ago with their brains, like Al-Qaeda and a lot of American evangelical Christians. They still believe the word is holy and all those things. But it was holy for people back then. Before we had the printing press, it was enormously valuable. Do you know what a book like this cost to produce in 1550, 100 years later? after the printing press revolution happened? 30 cents. Now, if books, if books go from 150,000 euros to 30 cents each within 100 years, that is going to be one hell of a revolution. So what happened when the printing press came was that all of a sudden we could print a lot of books and we can print them in huge quantities. That in turn spurred a lot of people to write more books and publish more books. It also made it easier and cheaper for people to learn how to read and write. And because more people read, read, could read and write, there was another incentive to produce more books. So we get a positive feedback loop that all of a sudden we have loads and loads of books. And we have libraries. The first libraries are social, but eventually we have private libraries. Everybody has a lot of books at home and they read these books. Not only books, somebody came up with the idea. We can, we can publish one new book every day. It's called a newspaper. Or we can publish one new book every week. It's called a magazine. All of a sudden, there's loads and loads of more information available at a lot lower price. That's exactly why we created a brand new society. That's exactly why we were able to do that. I'll give you an example of that. In 1807, well, the whole revolution was really filtering through, and almost every kid in Europe was going to school by then, by 1807. But in 1807, a tiny little angry Corsican dwarf called Napoleon stormed through Europe with his new army. Out of the mess that France was during the French Revolution, all of a sudden, France was totally organized. And they had a huge, really efficient army that stormed through Europe and conquered absolutely everything until the Siberian winter finally killed them. There's no human being on the planet could stop them. Now, this metaphor, the Napoleon's army, is an extremely strong metaphor because all of industrial society in the 19th century 
the factories, the schools, the universities, the nation states with the bureaucracies, the modern corporations, all the big oil companies, everything you think of. All these old what we call patriarchal institutions that our parents have worked for all the time. All these institutions were built on one metaphor and it was an explosive metaphor from 1807 described by a wonderful German philosopher called Hegel. Hegel was sitting south of Berlin in a town called Jena, where they make really nice cameras, by the way. He was sitting in Jena. All the other Germans hated Napoleon. But Hegel couldn't care about the Germans. He was a universalist. He was interested in humanity. He thought Germans were just bigoted, stupid old Prussian peasants. He couldn't care. What Hegel cared about was that he saw history sweeping through Jena. So when Napoleon's army was walking through Jena, he said, this is the future. And he wrote an amazing book called The Phenomenology of Spirit in 1807, one of the most groundbreaking works of the laws I've ever done, where he described Napoleon's army as the future. And everybody who read that book and understood it, just like Google think tank people read me now, could trace the future in it. Because everything we then built in the 19th century was built on this metaphor. But the amazing thing with Napoleon's army, what made it unique, you probably were taught at school that what made Napoleon's army so efficient, besides Napoleon's own personal genius, was the fact that it was a conscripted army. If you were young, if you were male, if you were French, you were forced to be in the army. That's the first time that happened. But that's not what made Napoleon's army so fucking incredibly efficient. What made it so efficient was that it was the first army in human history where all the soldiers, even the cannon fodder, could read and write. And if you can read and write, you're a thousand times more creative and useful than if you can't read and write. That was Napoleon's genius. Because France was the first country in the world where all kids were taught how to read and write. So they were also consequently the first country where they created an army where everybody could read and write. And a soldier who can read and write is a lot smarter than a stupid and alphabet soldier who can't read and write. He will always win. That's the beauty of it. So we should have a lot of respect for our parents. Because our parent used the printing press to create Napoleon's army, to create all those huge institutions that created an enormous amount of wealth and that moved the center of attention of the world to Europe and North America, where industrialism peaked. All this explosion we saw in the 19th century dates back to the 15th century in the innovation of the printing press. But because without a massive amount of reading and writing going on, and cheap books and cheap newspapers, and even a printing press that can develop paper money, that system that they lived within, the system that invented the Stone Age, would never have been possible. Now, none of this that I've talked about now is really controversial today with historians. Historians discovered this already in the 1960s. If you stop looking at the history as a history of kings and battlefields, and start looking at the big, big trends over long periods of time, the really relevant things, the real revolutions, not revolutions of people are bloody and kill each other in the street in Paris, but rather the big revolutions over time, these are the three major revolutions we had so far. Now, what Söderqvist and I then started exploring is and this is where our philosophy was unique and the first. We started exploring in 1998 was the fact, what if the internet is a fourth revolution? What if the internet is the fourth one? This would give us an interactive language. Let's look at that. Let's look at that hypothesis. What if the internet is the fourth big revolution? And we all realize now, looking at history, we see what an enormous difference to the world the printing press made. Are you agree with me on that one? It totally changed the world. It changed the way we look at ourselves. A hundred years into the printing press revolution in France in the 18th century, we had the Enlightenment philosophers. We had Voltaire, we had Descartes, we had Rousseau. They opposed the Catholic Church and provided us with a whole new metaphysics called humanism. The idea of the individual as the center of the universe. Descartes' idea, I think, therefore I am. The most famous tweet from the 18th century. That's exactly what it is. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. What's interesting here, the two things that are interesting with this statement. The first thing is what is lacking in here. Do you see God anywhere in here? 
God has been removed. Descartes was very, very clever. He realized that if I said that God never existed, the Catholic Church are going to go after me and they're going to kill me. And I don't want to die. I want to be a happy guy. I want to have a good life. I want to fuck a lot of women. I want to have a nice time, you know, drink lots of alcohol and all that. So I don't want to die. So instead of saying that God never existed, I'm going to say God is asleep. I'm going to remove God from the equation of what it means to be a human being. And instead he said, I think, therefore I am. He put the I at the center of things. That is what Enlightenment philosophers did. And what the Enlightenment philosophers did really in the 18th century in France was that they supplied us with a new worldview so we could remove Catholicism out of the picture and say, no, we're not going to be Catholics anymore. And as you probably know by now, the only Catholics we still have in the world are some stupid people in Nigeria and some women in Poland. And that's it. Catholicism is dead by now. Slowly dying, eventually. It takes time, these things. But humanism is what our parents believe in. They believe in humanism. They believe that the individual is the starting point of reality, that I think, therefore I am, and that's a given, and that's an automatic fact, and that cannot be questioned. You know what? We're going to kill that for them. We're going to kill humanism here today, because humanism goes out the window just like any system metaphysics always does when a new paradigm comes in. That's how profound the Internet is. The Internet is killing the idea of the individual. You are now an empty space. Your idea of who you are is from now on an empty space. And we're going to try to fill it up with something more meaningful that makes sense in the Internet age. So, is the interactive language really a fourth language? Well, there are two requirements for this. If we're going to empirically look at this, there are two requirements. The first is that I said before that empirically, scientifically, we should have an information explosion. We should all of a sudden have a million times more information available to us that we can use. Otherwise, we don't talk about a new paradigm. Okay. Between the 1st of January 2009 and the last of December 2009, there was more information produced in the world than in the entire human history up until the 31st of December 2008. The Internet is truly an information explosion. There's a lot more information being produced and there's a lot more information being available. As a matter of fact, when you put your Android or your iPhone into your pocket, you put the whole fucking world history information into your pocket. Now, you might be very stupid and not know how to use it, but that's another story. But technically speaking, all the world's information ever made is now available in your pocket to you. That is quite different from a public library with 400 books in it. That is radically different. So the first stage is fulfilled. The information explosion theorem is fulfilled. The other theorem is here, is interactive language radically different from mass media language, which is what we had before. We had books. The old paradigm was books, newspapers. Um, it was the paper money. It's a communication form. We had uh, a radio and television. Oh, wait a second. Radio and television, aren't they electronic? Yes, technologically speaking, they're electronic, but sociologically speaking, they're not electronic. They're mass media, they're printing press. A radio is an electronic printing press. Television is an electronic printing press. Because a printing press works exactly like Napoleon's army. This is the way it works. At the top is a head. And from the head, information is directed to a second layer of a hierarchy. And from there, information is directed downwards. And information only flows in one direction. If you go to North Korea, it's absolutely obvious. Because you have Kim Jong-un here. And he dictates to his generals. And the generals tell the people how the world works. Unfortunately, the United States and Germany and Sweden, until the internet arrived, look pretty much the same. I know, because I lived in Sweden in the 1980s, and we only had one state television channel that dictated to us what the world was like until 1987. They would have the prime minister on television every day. His name was Olof Palme and said that he was God, more or less. And that was the only option. You could not think outside of that box, because there's no other story available to you. That is Napoleon's army. That's the printing press. That's the kind of society we have lived in. This is the society of our parents. So everything works like this. What happened was that the books worked like that. The newspapers only made that system even more efficient, even faster.
because there are very few newspapers and you needed a license to run a newspaper, you needed money to run a newspaper, you basically needed one of those factory owners that you had dinner with to pay for you to run the newspaper and the newspaper would write that the factory was an amazing place to work in and the factory would write there was a Stone Age once, etc, etc. So you would have a self-fulfilling system of an ideology. And this ideology was the ideology of Napoleon's army. The ideology was that this is a great structure and it's the only structure possible, which was absolutely right at the time. This was the only way you could organize a society. Germany did this enormously efficient. If you look at organization theory, you can go, exam for example, to the 19th century in the German colonies in Africa. And when Germany finally got their asses out there and took the worst parts of Africa that were left after the French and the English had been there, they also organized the colonies much better than anybody else did. They used the Napoleon's army system. Do you know how many Germans it took to control the territory of Rwanda Urundi in Africa? It was an area populated by three million Africans. Do you know how many Germans they needed to control that system? Twelve. One year, eleven more here, and then lots of Africans. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing system. It's an amazing system. I have to admit it. As an organization theorist, which is what I am, I say, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And imagine, as long as these are the only information flows available in a given society, all you need to do is to control those information flows, and that's quite easy to do. You run a fucking government, or you run a big corporation. And if the guy from the big corporation and the guy from the government have dinner together, there's no way you can beat them. That's, for example, what the United States of America looks like today, the ultimate nation state. Of course they hate Julian Assange. Why? Because Julian Assange is only the beginning of a resistance against the system, of the possibility of creating something radically different. What happened? What happened was that in the 1980s, a phenomenon, a really nasty phenomenon called the internet, started to sneak out of universities and military institutions and were put into the hands of regular citizens. I remember in 1987, for the first time, when I had a computer at home that was connected through a fat cable into the wall, and I was connected to the internet, and I could start communicating with other people. And already the very same day, I realized, this is going to change the world in a fundamental way. And those who have the power now have no idea. This is going to happen right under the nose. History is going to be repeated. Just like the aristocrats and the cardinals and the monarchs were sitting in the countryside 400 years ago having dinner together saying, those awful cities in there with the Jews and the faggots and the Negroes and all those other horrible people are living, building their stupid ugly factories. One day we're going to have a plague where there's going to be huge fire and that city is going to be burned down and Berlin's going to disappear and they all have to move back out to the German countryside and they're all going to worship us again in our wonderful costumes and go to our church and kiss the king's ass and they're going to listen to the priest and they're going to work hard for the aristocrat. They were fat, lazy bastards because the old paradigm had given them so many favors. So they wouldn't move. What they didn't realize was that the printing press had made it possible to build huge cities. And in huge cities you can build huge factories because you can now employ people in factories because they could read and write and handle very complex procedures, which is required in a factory. And that was so powerful they took over the world. Eventually everything moved to the city. And the countryside became something people in the city laughed at. And finally, one day in the 19th century, the French factory owners would go out to the countryside and they would buy the property. And they would ironically keep maybe the aristocrat in one of the small houses. They could laugh at him. Read Balzac, the French writer, for an amazing story of the power shift in France from the aristocracy to the bourgeoisie, the owners of the factories. What's happening now is exactly the same thing. History is repeating itself. Under the nose of nation states, governments, and big corporations, something brand new is developing, and they don't get how powerful it is. They don't understand it's going to wipe them off the map of the earth. That's how profound this thing is. Because it takes one tiny empirical experiment to study this. What I did was that instead of asking engineers at Nokia and Ericsson with all the lazy guys were doing in 1998 about the future of the internet, I went to Korea. I took my little buddy and went to Korea and interviewed Korean schoolgirls. 
Because of all the people on the planet, the real innovators when it comes to use of technology are Korean schoolgirls. They are the first guys to pick up something new in their smartphones and use it before everybody else does. What Korean schoolgirls do today, the rest of humanity do five years from now. Always remember that sentence. What Korean schoolgirls do today, the rest of us do five years later. So, what we did was one tiny experiment. I put a smartphone in front of each Korean schoolgirl and next to that a regular mobile phone. And I told them, here's the regular mobile phone, you can call and you can text. Here's a smartphone, you can call, you can text, plus there are thousands of apps you can use to communicate with the rest of the world and get information. And then we just checked which one of the two phones did the girls take. They all took the smartphone. Every one of them took the smartphone. Now, why do they do that? Why do they do that? They take the smartphone because the smartphone enables them to communicate with the rest of the world all the time. And they love that. As a matter of fact, what the Korean schoolgirl does when she picks up the smartphone is she stops reading books. She stops reading newspapers. She stops listening to radio. And she says, fuck you, television. I never want to see you ever again. Because she will never, ever again consume media. She will only participate in media. Now, that is radical. Participation in media is something very, very different from sitting in North Korea watching Kim Jong-un smiling and waving at you. These are two totally different worlds. So we saw this behavior in the Korean schoolgirls and I realized, hasn't anybody understood how profound this is? And finally I got in touch with Google's think tank and some other smart people and they were getting it too. But we wrote the books about it. But this is where internet philosophy is at now. There's no longer any controversy surrounding this hypothesis that the internet is the fourth major information revolution. We only now begin to grasp how profound this revolution is. The internet is different from books, newspapers, radio, and television. Because the internet invites us to communicate on everything we find. That's exactly why there's not a single newspaper article anywhere in the world anymore that doesn't have a commentary feel to it. Because if we're not allowed to comment and alter and change what we supposedly consume, we're not interested. We turn it off. Just like the printing press killed an army of people who wrote books. In 1450, we had over 300,000 people around Europe who professionally wrote books, copied the Bible, copied the Quran, copied every book that existed, sat and hand wrote books. There were 300,000 of those people in 1450. In 1550, there was not a single one left. That's why I think maybe the hard times right now in Greece and Spain are not that bad after all. There's a lot of people that shouldn't have the old jobs they used to have. They have to invent new things to do because we're going through such a radical information revolution right now that we have to realize that mass media is dead. Don't do television, don't do radio, don't do books. Don't do any of these old media, they're dead. Because unless what you're doing is communicating, people are not gonna be interested. Especially not the powerful ones. Especially not the ones that you really want to communicate with. So what we then found out was that what happened was that what the internet did from the 1980s onwards is that these guys here, started talking to each other, which they'd never been able to do before. They started commenting on television shows, they started commenting newspaper articles, they started blogs where they comment on things. Suddenly the blogs had more readers than the newspaper did because the blogs invited participation. And anybody who invites participation will always win over somebody who says, I'm not listening to anyone, everybody should hear me. If you stand there and say, I'm Kim Jong-un, you should listen to me, I don't want to listen to you, they just walk out. They're not going to say that, they walk out. They feel offended. They're like, we live in the internet age now. If you don't want to communicate with me, I'm not going to listen to you. Either we trade information with each other, either we have a dialogue, either we talk to each other and listen to each other and share and build something wonderful together, or I'm out. So what these guys did was that everybody started talking to each other and listening less and less and less here. And what is happening now at this stage in history is that this is being cut off and this guy dies. All we have left is this. Loads of babble. But that's the world now. This is the world now. This is what the world looks like now. 
It's chaos. We go to psychiatry clinics. We take all these pills. We're confused. But of course we're confused. We've been thrown into a mess. But we love this mess so much we can't get out of it. Because we can't stop communicating. It's addictive. We're all communicating all the time. We even have to realize that what we're doing now is that we're creating a class structure. That's the groundbreaking idea of the netocrats. That's a nasty news with that book. I told you before, the concept of an autocracy, of a new elite, of a new elite of social monsters who know exactly how to use Facebook and Twitter to dictate and to involve others and to control them and to manipulate them to get power, which you do through communication. You listen in, you take information people, you make something more wonderful out of it, you throw it out again. These type of social monsters, these netocrats, that's not even controversial. We know perfectly well that the netocrats are taking over the world. That's why they're dangerous to nation states governments. That's why they're dangerous to big corporations. Because they're going to eventually win over the old power structure. But what we have to realize is that what you do online, when you are online, will determine which class you will belong to. Because opposite the netocrats, we have to realize that we have a new underclass, which we call consumptarians. When people go online, we have consumptarians. We have some people like me who actually do have 4,000 Facebook friends that they know. And we have some people who have 14 friends on Facebook, consumptarians. We have some people who go online to communicate with others because they love communicating with people and doing wonderful, creative things together with others. Without, you know, having to make a profit necessarily, just having fun with other people. They become netocrats because they become very skillful at communicating and they can take that skill with them to the next communication they have. They take it from dialogue to dialogue to dialogue and only get better and better at doing what they're doing. But we also have people who go online and all they do when they go online is that they watch porn and play a game and not communicate with anybody. That is typical underclass behavior today. And we call them consumptarians. And if the government should do anything, it's help these guys. And I predict this in 1998. I said, we're going to have political parties in Europe within 14 years that appeal to the consumptarians. They're called the extreme right. And now they're, in government, now they're in parliaments around Europe everywhere. Because nobody listened to what I said. They feel offended. They feel left out. And it's exactly these guys. They're usually guys. They're between 30 and 40. They're unemployed. They're overweight. They live all around Europe. They have their big tummies. They have no job. No girl wants to fuck with them. And they're sitting there alone, and all they can think of with the internet is to jerk off to porn and play a game. And be used. Consume. And of course they're bitter. Because they're the new underclass. That's what the internet does. So do you see now how this whole new structure is beating the old one? And these guys are the ones we have to watch out for because the netocrats are going to take over and rule the world. That's the theory of these three books. You have the whole theory there. So, now I'm going to look at what's really valuable and the society. So you can focus. This, this, is, this is like for you now to be smart and clever. What should you do? What we should do then quickly is to look at the last two paradigms. And then you have a lunch break, okay? The last paradigm was the industrial age. The new paradigm is the internet age based on two different forms of communication. We used to build factories and we lived in cities. Do you live in cities now? No, you don't. You live in cyberspace. When I told you before where you could find me, I told you you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. You could probably find my Gmail address that way as well. You find me online. We all live online. There's not a single person in this room who's not here because you first, you've all decided first online that you're going to be here in the first place. And you're probably all online by now anyway. We live online. We should understand that we live online today. The physical world is secondary to us. The primary world to us today is the online world. If somebody wants to find out who you are, they go to your Facebook page, they read everything you put in there, look at the pictures, then they decide what they think of you. They don't even meet you in the flesh. You live in the online world. This world used to be driven by money. My dad, he's going to die soon. He's over 80 now. And in my dad's world, he lives by the axiom, the guy who has the most money when he dies wins. Everybody's competing for making the most money. That's the typical example of factor owning. It's called capitalism. The idea is that you should make a lot of money, and if you have a lot of money, you get a lot of freedom. There was a truth to that, but it's no longer valid. What we have to understand is that the way the internet operates, 
where a blogger with no money in his pocket at all can beat a big fucking corporation like Coca-Cola that has billions of dollars. If you have a better idea, you can beat them. That's a society driven by attention. And attention works this way. It has two factors. One is awareness, and one is credibility. And if you think about it, if you think about your current life situation where you are right now in your life, when you think about what you're going to do with your studies, eventually what you're going to do with your career, what kind of li life you want to live, what you want to do with your life before you die, when you think about those things, you will always return to the fact that as soon as you start communicating with other people, they're going to value you according to two parameters, awareness and credibility. Awareness is, do they even know that you exist? Do people know that you exist? If they don't know that you exist, there's no way they open a communication with you. If you send an email today to Sergey Brin of Google, he's not going to respond to you because he doesn't know who you are. So the awareness factor kills your communication with him right away. So what we're all struggling for right now is to make other people aware that we exist. That's not really narcissistic, it's a survival strategy. We have to make other people aware that we exist. That's why I come here and for free give a speech about the book today, so that a few more people know that I wrote this book and can spread the message and use it. The other factor is credibility. Everything today is down to credibility. Once you get the awareness of somebody, do you keep their attention? Do they consider you unique? Do they consider you special? Do you, do you provide them with something that enlightens them, that expands their life, that makes it possible for them to do more and more wonderful things, to be more creative and more social and live an expanded life? Because if you don't apply them with that, if you just apply them with a banal slogan or something, you're called a spammer and they turn you off and they never turn you on again because you probably killed your credibility. And if you kill the credibility, they're never ever going to listen to you ever again because everything you say is going to end up in the spam box. These two factors is what everybody's obsessed with today. From a big corporation trying to market a product, from an internet gaming company going here to Campus Party in Berlin to try to sell their latest game, from a developer of technology, they're all screaming here for your attention. Because without that attention, they die. And even today, when we go to a bar in Berlin on a Saturday night and we're really drunk, before we go outside the door, we're thinking, what have I dressed myself in? What kind of clothes do I wear? And once I woke up to somebody I really like to take to bed that night, do I have something interesting to say that gets their attention so they want to go back with me to the hotel room and go to bed with me? Attention. Never, ever in this chain do you see any dollar or euro signs. Never. The internet is a phenomenon that doesn't operate with money. Almost everything you need to be powerful in internet is for free. It's there available and it's down to you and your philosophical understanding of what the internet is combined with your creativity is the only thing that sets the limits to what you can achieve on the online. Did Julian Assange have any money when he started Wikileaks? No. Did Dick Falcone have any money when he started the Pirate Movement? No. Did Sarah Gabriel and Larry Page have any money when they started Google? No. None of them did. Nobody does. Actually, having money could probably be a problem because your parents will call you all the time and ask for a return on their investment. This is a non-money society. Capitalism is dead. Attentionalism is the thing now. I'm not saying it's going to be any nicer than capitalism, but it's a radically different system that requires a radically different set of thoughts. So you need to work on your attention all the time, and we all do. Even when we're going to the gym running, we're working on our bodies looking a little bit better, so we look a little bit more attractive. When we're physical, for example, on our Facebook photo, Everything we do now operates according to this obsession we have with attention. Because we're obsessed with our communication with other human beings. Because we're obsessed with our communication with other human beings, we want to improve that communication. We want to expand it to include more friends, more interesting people maybe, than the ones we already have around us. Because that makes us more powerful. So, at the end of the day, what we need to look at here is how we summarize this into a system of metaphysics. Because every society has its own way of doing metaphysics. Metaphysics is something we human beings require. We freak out completely if we don't have an explanation for how everything goes together. The metaphysics here in, in the old paradigm, it used to be God and religion. 
told you before. History writing in the 13th century was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and a snake or whatever. Because the Pope paid the bill to the historians. Then came industrialism. We had a different kind of history writing with Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, all those things. We moved in here. A human being here in the Middle Ages was an obedient person. Obey God was the ultimate ethical mandate. You obey God and you become a good human being. And being a human being means being somebody who obeys God. What was it here? We discussed it before. Descartes, I think, therefore I am. The individual. Our parents are individuals. Our parents work on their self-realization. They think life is a race. And somehow, during this race, you have to realize yourself and become who you truly are. That's our parents' ideology. That's our parents' metaphysics. That's the idea of humanism. But according to this theory, that idea dies too. I never met God. Somebody met a burning bush sometime. Remember that? I never met God. So I, 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 I say, okay, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. That's an easy thing to do. But I never met an individual either. Have you? I met a lot of bodies who think they're individuals. But I've never met an individual. Descartes was smart. He knew that that would be a really tough question. So he placed the individual inside the brain. Just one more minute. He placed the individual inside the brain. He's got, she's got, she's got me going now, Jana. She placed the individual inside the brain because Descartes was smart. He knew he would have a clever student eventually say, where is the individual then if there is an individual? I never met one. He placed it inside the brain. He said, this, this, he, said, he said, the individual is inside the brain in a gland and he's sitting in there. He's like a little old guy and he's watching the world like if it was a cinema screen. From inside there. It's like when you watch with your eyes, you think there's somebody sitting inside your head and that little guy and that is really you. It's called the Cartesian theater. There is no little guy in there. There never was. The brain is what exists and the brain plays around with us and fools us, believing an illusion that we exist. The body and the brain is what exists, but there's no individual there. So if there is no individual there, why there I think, therefore I am? Why not just turn it around and say, something thinks, and it thinks something really stupid that has fooled itself into believing, but it doesn't really exist. That's a more valid statement, to be honest. We can kill Descartes. What is there is a body with a brain. And this brain is connected to all the other brains. The body and the brain have always been there, and now for the first time in history, this brain is connected to seven billion other brains. Totally, all the time. Zzz, into one being. One huge monster. We need to talk about ourselves as individuals. We are now all individuals, not individuals. Individual is a shared being. It's a schizophrenic creature. If you have schizophrenia, you have a winning formula. The internet is, is made for you. The more different personalities you can develop and be online, the better off you are. The more you can communicate, the more communities you can belong to, the more popular you'll be. You know, you'll be wonderful. You'll be somebody that everybody likes to talk to because I have five or six or seven different personalities, only one body. And I have these seven different personalities online. I'm one person in the morning, another person at night, I'm another person when I do that, another person when I do that. The more you can think of yourself as a split personality, ironically, what used to be called schizophrenia, the more you're a winner now. And if you look around yourself, of all the guys here who are on to something, because you all know that out of 100 ideas that are sales pitched here this week, one will work at best. 99 will just fail because they're too boring. They're not original enough. They're not brilliant enough. But if you look at the really brilliant ideas you find here, they're all based on a person sitting there going, well, I'm a lot of different people at one time, and I love to collaborate with others who are a lot of people at the same time. The more of a schizophrenic you are, the more winning you are. This idea of the individual is called syntheism. And this is a new term that's not even in the book. And I love the term. There's a synthist movement now starting online. It was started by people who started going to the Burning Man Festival in Nevada in America. I had to go there because I'm a philosopher to see what was going on. What I saw was 55,000 extremely creative people, most of them from California, gathering in a desert that was like living on planet Mars, like hell on Earth. And they loved every second of it. A lot of them were taking a lot of hallucinogenic drugs too, sure. But Twitter was invented there. Most of the brand new, really brilliant things that we use today were invented at Burning Man. 
It's exactly what people at Silicon Valley do when they want to get creative. It's the hidden story of Silicon Valley that is far more important than all the guys who finance new entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. The real reason why it's exploding is because of that. And why Berlin right now is the center of internet startups in Europe has a lot to do with a festival called Fusion. What we have to realize is that the culture that young people are living in today connected with the internet and connected with the sense of, I don't fear anything. I don't have to talk to my dad. I don't have to listen to governments. I don't have to please corporations. I can just go ahead and do this on my own, be my own entrepreneur, and start this whole thing, and people will follow with me in a movement. When you realize that, when you realize the enormous liberties you have right now, historically speaking, you can become an etocrat if you decide to be one by following this. You know what synthism means? I'm going to finish there. Synthism is based on the Greek word synthios. Synthios means the God that we create because we are together. The God that we as human beings create by being together. What the fuck? That's exactly what the internet is. It's a fucking God that we created. That's where I'll end up. Okay, you're welcome to communicate with me. I'm here all day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please stay around for some questions. We will be by the States.